Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a new one entitled The Book of the Beginning. And this is the first lesson in, entitled The Creation. So you might guess that this is about the book of Genesis. This is the lesson for April 2 of 2022. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have gathered once again to consider your word and to think about the implications of the details of your word here and what it should mean to us in light of how in conflict it is with so many of the beliefs common in our world today. Help us to see clearly through what you have provided for us and how we can understand you more clearly through your acts is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we we'll start with a question. What is the earliest known history recorded in Scripture? Well, it would have, as far as I know, it would have to be the record of the rebellion in heaven as recorded in Revelation 12, 7 through 12. We'll look at that a little bit later. Ellen White suggests that the one, that one of the challenges that God faced in dealing with the rebellion of Lucifer, Satan, was over the creation of the wor this world. Lucifer wanted to be a part of the creation committee. And my computer is, not, is now misbehaving again. There we go. Of this world. Well, um, however, God recognized that as a creature, Lucifer had nothing to contribute. So Genesis 1 and 2 marked the beginning of human history. There are a number of technical reasons for the from the original Hebrew language to suggest that these records in Genesis 1 and 2 follow the normal wording used to describe daily events throughout the Old Testament. So when we talk about the evening and the morning, we're talking about a 24-hour period, and that is true right through the Old Testament. One of the most challenging things for many people to understand is the purpose of putting the tree of knowledge of good and evil in that beautiful garden, especially in the middle of it. We will discuss that briefly later and more next week. It is significant for us to realize that God created uh, our wonderful world in its original pristine condition in preparation for the arrival of humans. That is a perfect example of God's grace and is a foretaste of God's grace that will uh, be acting in the end of human history when he will recreate this earth for our benefit. So what should be our response to God's creation? Jim? Psalms 100 verses 1 to 3. Sing to the Lord all the world. Worship the Lord with joy. Come before him with happy songs. Acknowledge that the Lord your God, Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people, we are his flock. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay, the Christian understanding of Genesis begins with God. As we will note later, the evolutionary approach to origins does everything it possibly can to eliminate God. In Genesis 1 and 2, we're going to see two different presentations of God. These are more obvious in the Hebrew than in English. In Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, that's the first presentation. The use of the name for God, Elohim, in Hebrew suggests his supremacy, his transcendence, his strength, and his preeminence. In the original language, the use of the plural Elohim, instead of the singular El, suggests the idea of majesty and transcendence once again. In the second creation account of Genesis 2, verses 4 through 25, the word suggests a very personal God known as Yahweh. In Hebrew, just those four letters. Remember, in Hebrew, they don't write the vowels. It's Y-H-W-H, and of course, if we were writing in Hebrew, it would be the other way around. They start on the right and go to the left. This name is considered too sacred to pronounce if you're reading Hebrew. That name suggests closeness and relationship. So the total picture suggests that we are dealing with a being who has infinite grandeur and power, however, at the same time, 
God wants to be close to us. Many of the Psalms suggest that worshiping God should always be associated with remembrance of his work of creation. For example, Psalm 95, Psalm 139, and comparing, of course, Revelation 14, 7, which we are familiar with as a part of the three angels' messages. So how are we supposed to recognize God's awesome majesty and power and yet feel comfortable in his presence? Remember, there's places in the Bible where it talks about God is a destroying fire and so forth. Do you feel comfortable like you'd like to run up and give him a hug? Well, we're supposed to be close to him, recognize his forgiveness and love. What does it mean to serve God with fear then? In the original language, the word often translated fear also means reverence and respect. Look over Genesis 1. You've probably done that many times. Repeated, we see the expression, it was good, or in some of the modern translations, God was pleased with his creation day by day. And when the week was finished and he created man, he said, it was very good, Genesis 1, 31. That's from the King James Version. And then God gives us a reason and a way to celebrate, celebrate everything he had done. Carrie? I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day. Because by that day, he had completed his creation and stopped working. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, a little more Hebrew here. The word translated good, it's, the word is tov in Hebrew, and all those verses back in Genesis 1 means not just that it works, that it, it functioned properly, but also that it's beautiful and very appealing to human beings. That word also sometimes is used, in, for example, in Genesis 2, 17, to express what is good in opposition to what is bad. Dwayne? Genesis 2, 17 reads, The Lord said, Accept the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day, from the Good News Bible. So here's an example of using that word good as opposed to bad. This description of the creation radically contradicts the theories of evolution, which dog dogmatically declare that the world shaped itself progressively through a succession of accidental happenings, starting from an inferior condition and progressing to a superior one. In contrast, the biblical author affirms that God intentionally and suddenly created the world. There was nothing happenstance or chancy about it, any of it. The world did not come about by itself, but only as a result of God's will and word, Genesis 1-3. The verb bara, create, translated in Genesis 1 as in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, occurs only with God as its subject. And it denotes abruptness, God spoke, and it was so from our adult, Bible, Bible, adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, March 28. Imagine how good things must have been for God to be very pleased. Genesis 131, we have mentioned that verse. Let's just look at it in its totality there. God looked at everything he had made and he was very pleased. Everything passed, evening passed and morning came. That was the sixth day. The Genesis account describes each day as evening and morning. The, that expression in the Bible always refers to literal days. Furthermore, if the vegetation was created on the third day or long be, when I, I day in qu quotation marks, some people try to suggest that these days were long periods of time, so I'm using it in that context. If this was created on the third day or long period of time and the sun and moon were only created on the fourth day, how did the vegetation survive without the sun for any prolonged period of time? It doesn't make sense in that context. Of course, the real reason for the origin of the theory of evolution, let's 
nail this down clearly, was to remove God from his position as creator and especially to try to remove him from the position of being the final judge of all men. Evolutionists do not want to think that they will ever be um, responsible to any ultimate righteous authority. So the real difference between a creation explanation of origins and an evolutionary explanation of origins is God. Does God exist or doesn't he? And if he exists, will we ultimately be judged by him? That's really the question. And if you go back and you study the origin of the theories of evolution, uh, they will go into all kinds of scientific detail about how it could have happened and so forth. But the theological reason behind it all is, can we explain the origins of human beings? Can we explain the origins of everything without God? That was the great challenge. Many scientists and even people with a scientific bent in their thinking look at Genesis 1 and think that it is far too simple. Where is the scientific evidence? But there is a very clear answer to that accusation. When speaking of Genesis and origins, we are speaking about who and why and very little about how. Suppose for a moment, and here's a proposition I would like you to think of out there. Suppose for a moment that God had given Moses a full understanding of every scientific detail of how he created the earth. And suppose that, in other words, suppose El, uh, Moses understood all the physics, he knew about the, about the you know, nuclear stuff and all the electrons and protons and all that stuff. Suppose he knew all that and the chemistry, all of that. Who would he tell? Who could he communicate with? Even the language, Moses was writing at a time when alphabets had just been invented. The language was very simple. There was no possibility that he could have, if he knew all that, he could have communicated with anybody, even if he wanted to. Is it any, is it any surprise that when God declared that his work was very good and that he was well pleased, that he would encourage us to join him in the celebrating? Look again at Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Jim? <coughs> By the seventh day, God finished what he had been, excuse me, what had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day he had completed the, his creation and stopped working. Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11. Which of course is the fourth commandment. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath is, excuse me, is a day of rest de dedicated to me. And that day, no one is to work, whether you, your children, your slaves, your animals, or, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Good news, Bible. God recognizes that we also are supposed to work six days a week. That is why he has given us a Sabbath so that we can celebrate all his gifts to us just as he did at the end of creation week. Kerry? Contrary to some ancient and modern beliefs, nothing in Scripture, Old or New Testament, denigrates the body as evil. That's a pagan concept, not a biblical one. Well, let's interrupt there for just a little bit. What are we talking about here? Many people believe that, in fact, if we go back to the pagan ideas, that the body is evil. Anything you can touch, the table, we, the computer, whatever you want, if you can touch it, it's evil. What you can't touch is good. So this is what we're talking about. They're saying, you know, that none of that stuff really matters. Um, it's it's the, the stuff you can't touch which is good. But God made the body and he made it good. We're going to look at that in detail. Continuing, which includes their own flesh, and that is why they can enjoy the creation and why they take care of it. 
is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, March 29. The expression used in Genesis to describe the fact that God finished his work, quote, and that, open quote, it was complete, end quote, is used in Exodus 40, verse 33, when the tent tabernacle in the wilderness was com completed. When they finished that, remember at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses had been given all these directions and they did everything, and he uses the same expression. When it was finished, okay, it's done, it's finished. Okay, same expression. It's also we used when it, talk, when it talks about finishing Solomon's tabernacle, Solomon's tent, not tent, I'm sorry, Solomon's temple that was built there on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. When it was finished, it was used the same expression. It was complete, it was finished in 1 Kings 7, 40, and again in 50, verse 51. As we know from our study of scripture, Jesus created many challenges and much animosity by performing miracles of healing on the Sabbath. Why do you think he did that? Hold on, sorry. Um, yeah. Is it true that God will one day heal all of our problems? eliminating sin, sickness, death, and, and disease, and we, we will celebrate all that by continuing to keep the Sabbath on the earth made new? Look, for example, at Luke 13, 13 to 16. Let's just look at that for a moment. He placed his hands on this the woman who, who was, came, was, was bent over and so forth like this, and he healed her. He placed his hands on her, and at once she straightened herself up and praised God. The official at the synagogue was angry that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. So he spoke up and said to the people, there are six days in which we should work. So come during those days and be healed, but not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, any one of you would untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and take it out to give it water on the Sabbath. Now here is the, this, this descendant of Abraham whom Satan has kept bound up for 18 years. Should she not be released on the Sabbath? The Genesis account deals in considerably more detail with the creation of human beings than other events of that week. Dwayne? Genesis 1, 26 reads, Then God said, And now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and the animals, domestic and wild, large and small. Can I interrupt for a second? I've always wondered how you would have power over the fish. <laughs> you say, come here, fish. <laughs> anyway, just an interesting... Farm raising, huh? <laughs> yeah, I see. Go ahead. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female, blessed them, and said, have many children, so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I'm putting you in charge of the fish the birds, and all the wild animals. I have provided all kinds of grain and all kinds of fruit for you to eat. Okay, you want to go ahead and do Genesis 2, 7 as well. <laughs> then the Lord God took some of the soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. Okay, from the Good News Bible again. Now let's look at, try to look at that in some detail here that God has created human beings in his image is one of the boldest statements in the Bible. Only humans have been created in the image of God. I'm gonna contradict that statement in just a moment, see what you think. Though, quote, God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, Genesis 1.25, from the New King James Version, God created man in his own image, Genesis 1.27. This formula has often been limited to the spiritual nature, and people's thinking, by the way, the spiritual nature of humans, which is interpreted to mean that the image of God is understood to signify only administrative function in representing God or the spiritual function of relationship with God or with each other, from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, March 30. The above statement is contradicted by the following statement by Ellen White. Now this is one that not many have heard of. See what you think about this. Evil originated with Lucifer who rebelled against the government of God. Before his fall, he was a covering cherub. 
distinguished by his excellence. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible like himself. I have, that, that's a better statement. Hmm? That is a better statement yeah. th than that. Uh... Anyway, that's from the View and Herald, September 24, 1901, included, quoted in our SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1163, paragraph 1. However, Lucera does not have the, abil the ability to procreate as humans do. So, that's mine. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power. Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. And again, from Review and Herald, Ellen White, February 11, 1902. So, uh, and she goes on to explain that we don't have time to look at all those quotes, but she suggests, and the Bible says that God himself would come in the cool of the evening and talk with them. And Ellen White adds that the angels often came and spoke with Adam and Eve. So now let's dig into this a little more. What does it mean to be made in the image and likeness of God? Jim? While these understandings are correct, they fail to include the important physical reality of this, of this creation. Both dimensions are indeed included in the two words image and likeness, describing the process in Genesis 1.26. While the Hebrew and word selim, image. image, refers to the concrete shape of a physical body, the word dimut, likeness, refers to abstract qualities that are comparable to the divine person. Okay, so what are we saying here? Go ahead. Actually, let's read the rest of the... Therefore, the Hebrew notion of the image of God should be understood in the holistic sense of the biblical view of human nature. The biblical text affirms that humans, excuse me, that human individuals, that is men and women, have been created in God's image physically as well as spiritually. Adult Bible study guide for Wednesday, March. Okay, so do you think we're made to look like God? Does he have a nose and eyes and mouth and... Who knows? Well, the only physical, uh, the, the infinite, well, probably you can't, is, is infinite, you can't quantify it. But when Jesus, you have Jesus, he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, what does it say, he wasn't uh, maybe as, as uh, good-looking, so to speak, mm -hmm. as, as the others, but, but uh, he wanted people uh, to believe based upon his teaching rather than be dazzled for his charismatic uh, appearance, appearance or something else like that, yes. Yeah. So, Ellen White has some comments about that. Look what she said. Carrie? When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. Now, when it says his physical appearance, physical nature, a likeness to his Maker, does that mean? That's pretty broad. Pretty broad, isn't it? Yeah. Go ahead. God created man in his own image, and that's from Genesis 1.27. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image, the more fully reflect the glory of the Creator. Now look, think about that. You know, imagine if we were still living in the Garden of Eden and, and every day we could, we could come to reflect God more fully. Wouldn't that be fantastic? All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. Vast was the scope offered for their exercise, glorious the field open to their research, the mysterious Mystery. mysteries of the visible universe, the, and in quotes, wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, unquote, Job 37, 16, invited man's study, 
Face to face, heart to heart, communion with his maker was his high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Throughout the eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer, obtain rather, clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation, more and more fully have reflected the Creator's glory. That's Alan White, Education 15.1. Okay, wow. <clears throat> in fact, this whole, in fact, go ahead, Dwayne, you can read that next one. Oh, in fact, this holistic understanding of the image of God, including the physical body, is reaffirmed in the other creation account, which says that man became a living being. Genesis 2.7. Literally, a living soul, nefesh, as the result of two divine operations. God formed and God breathed. Note that the breath often refers to the spiritual dimension, but it is also closely tied to the biological capacity for breathing, the part of the man that was formed of the dust of the ground. It is the breath of life, that is the breath spiritual and life physical. Let me interrupt for a second there. The same word in both Hebrew and Greek from the Bible that means breath also means spirit. So you can see how the challenge, and, and Jesus used that similarity when he spoke to Nicodemus in John 3. Um, he talks about the spirit and so forth there. So there's a, the breath spiritual and the life physical. Go ahead. God will later perform a third operation this time to create the woman from the body of the man, in Genesis 2, 21 and 22, in a way to emphasize that she is of the same nature as the man. Okay. Genesis 2, 21 to 23, Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, At last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone, and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name, because was, she was taken out of man. And uh, there's two comments that I always think about when I read that passage. My father was an anesthesiologist, and among anesthesiologists, they say God was first an anesthesiologist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he, put, he put man to sleep, and then he performed a perfect surgery. That was second. He was a great surgeon. And then he closed up the wound, and they, there was no sign of anything missing there at all. Did you, I don't know. Did, did God put another rib in place, or did he just leave him without that extra rib? Uh, who knows? But... Um, uh, the other expression that uh, sometimes or comments you probably heard is that God took one look at Adam and said, hmm, I can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and I guess the third one actually that we should add is that um, woman Eve was taken out of Adam, but every male from that day to this was taken out of woman. Yeah. Just to be clear here about who's doing what. <laughs> Do you know of any any account that that might indicate that here it says Adam finally saw someone who looked like him? Did did he not see that in God? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the thing that I, I, I wonder about a lot of what we hear about God is you can't see him. Yeah, he's flames well, I, and all this business. It's like yeah. Yeah, it's true. I, but I, like, I'm like i with Duane here. I think God must have appeared to Adam. And, uh, you know, we had a lesson a while back suggesting that God reached down, he, that he formed Adam maybe out of clay or something like this and got him perfectly, and he reached down and kissed him. And man, came a, a man became a, a man, became a living being. So, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to like yeah. that kind of an idea. Well, we know that God had no sooner created Adam than he began to bless him with three 
huge gifts. One, the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.8. Two, food, Genesis uh, 2.16. And three, the woman, Genesis 2.22. God gave Adam and Eve a wonderful relationship. They had each other. But there was one restriction on their freedom. And we'll read a lot more about that in our next lesson, but look at it briefly. As we read earlier, Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guide it, guard it. He said to him, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the fruit that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. So here's this gorgeous garden. You know, I, I don't know how big it was. I mean, obviously, if you, you make it very big, it would be way more than the food that, that two people could eat. I mean, you know, you could, I, probably two people could he keep up with about five or six trees, and that would be it if they continued continually bore. Uh, so I don't know how big the garden was. And uh, there is one place in Ellen White where it seems to suggest that if, they had, if we had remained in the garden and people had, had that, that the garden would have expanded. So maybe... Well, and the reason, and they were cast out of the garden. Remember, we, we read that there was an angel's garden. So the rest of it must not all have been that great. Yeah. You see, the, the, the garden was a... Was a <clears throat> A gem compared to the uh, the rest of the world. Yeah. So. Well, and yet here we have in the middle of this garden this gorgeous tree, the tree of life, which later in Revelation says it's going to, you know, everybody is going to going to get a new fruit, a new kind of food off of that tree every month. See, and uh, and if you put that together with Ezekiel, it some, some, seems to suggest that down along that river that flows out from the throne of God, there are trees, maybe plural trees of life, along both sides. So maybe there's more than one tree feeding all those people. But beside it, there in the garden, there was what? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, yeah. And now we have... I, I don't know how far away. ...good and evil that everybody can yeah. buy, buy stacks of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Humans were, attend to, were to attend to and care for the garden. They were given access to the fruits and grains and nuts produced by that garden and told um, that they could freely eat of all of them except for the one tree which was forbidden. And later man was to leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife so that they could form a new pair. Jim? Uh, Jim? Is that Gen 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 go sorry, go ahead. Genesis two excuse me, Genesis chapter two, verse twenty four. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one. Good news Bible. So why is it said that it's a man who must leave his parents and not the woman? Now there's several things, several as aspects to that. First of all, in the patriarchal system, I mean, you look at you look at Abraham and Isaac and Jacob; they all lived together. Yeah. It was normal for a, I mean, you would have a, a separate tent, probably whatever, and maybe separate a little bit, but it was common for if you when you when you form your own family, the woman leaves her family, she comes joins you, and you have a place next to your parents and maybe even next to your grandparents. So that would be the first reason why. I think it's stated, you know, the woman is to leave her father and mother and join herself to the man. That would be the common idea that they had in ancient times. So here's some additional ideas. Why is it said that it was a man who must leave his parents and not the woman? In the Bible, the word man, in Greek would be anthropos, is often used in the generic sense, including, not, uh, including both male and female. Consider the following several paragraphs from Evan, Ellen White in the story of redemption. Now, she's got quite a bit of very significant material here about the creation story. Carrie? Why is it said that if it is the man who must leave his parents? I just read that. Read Try the next paragraph. That light blots some of the words out. Okay. The father and the son engaged in the mighty 
wondrous work they had contemplated of creating the world. The earth came forth from the hand of the Creator exceedingly beautiful. There were mountains and hills and plains, and interspersed among them were rivers and bodies of water. The earth was not one extensive plain, but the monotony of the scenery was broken by hills and mountains, not high and ragged as they now are, but regular and beautiful in shape. Let me interrupt for a second. <laughs> Do you think God made the Garden of Eden, and I guess that's what she's talking about here, to look like what it looks like in heaven? Probably. On the other hand, a bit earlier, why does it say we attend to it? That we got to be, go weeding every day or something? Well, I, I mean, I wondered about that. Tend and guard. I mean, who's attacking it? Yeah. They need to be guarded. What What does that mean? Yeah. The bare high rocks were never seen upon them, but lay beneath the surface, answering as bones to the earth. The waters were regularly dispersed. The hills, mountains, and very beautiful plains were adorned with plants and flowers and tall, majestic trees of every description, which were many times larger and much more beautiful than trees now are. I, I don't know. If I've been someplace in the world, some places I think particularly of trees we saw in um, Costa Rica. There are some trees there. Of course, they, they can grow, you know, 12 months of the year, full speed. There's no, you know, winter season per se. But just enormous, yeah. just enormous trees. I mean, you could build two, three houses underneath one tree, and I, you could probably take one of those trees and make eight or ten houses out of the wood from it. Right. Just enormous. So I, when she says much, many times larger and much more beautiful than the trees now are, I think, whoa, what are those, what are those trees going to be like? And imagine... My kids, when we, when we grew up, and they grew up in Africa, I was a mission, working as a missionary out there, we ha one of the places we lived was next to a big tree. And amazingly enough, the, the branches were big and strong, and these kids, even though they were fairly young, decided that they, they actually had this divided up the tree. Okay, this is your region, this is my region. This, and they were scrambling up. And it's amazing one of them didn't fall out of that tree and, and hurt themselves, but nobody ever did. But again, I think about huge trees. They were right beside our house. So The air was pure and beautiful, and the earth seemed like a noble palace. Angels beheld and rejoiced at the wonderful and beautiful works of God. After the earth was created and the beasts upon it, the father and son carried out their purpose, which was designed before the fall of Satan to make man in their own image. Now let's interrupt for a I'm going to interrupt for a minute. There are several passages, especially in the New Testament and particularly in the book of Revelation, <coughs> that say that this was a plan before the creation of the earth. So this is not, ooh, Oh dear, what am I going to do now? Satan has rebelled. What, what, what? No, God had this all planned out. He knew what was coming. It was all planned. This is not God being surprised. Go ahead. They had wrought together in the creation of the earth and every living thing upon it. And now God said to his son, Let us make man in our image. As Adam came forth from the hand of his Creator, he was of noble height and of beautiful symmetry. He was more than twice as tall as men now living upon the earth and was well proportioned. I'm going to interrupt again. Someone has done some calculations figuring out yeah. uh, how much people would weigh uh, and estimated that Adam weighed about 1,500 pounds and Eve weighed about 1,200 pounds. So I tell ladies, eh, stop worrying. you." got a ways to go yet. <laughs> His features were perfect and beautiful. His complexion was neither white nor sallow, but ruddy, glowing with the rich tint of health. Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. Her head reached a little above her sh his shoulders. She too was noble, perfect in symmetry, and very beautiful. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with the covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. While they lived in obedience to God, this circle of light enshrouded them. 
let me interrupt again for a moment. Um, it's a challenge for artists to picture Adam and Eve. Yeah. How do you make a covering of light? <laughs> Ever thought about that? I, the thing you'd make would burn you. There was some, <laughs> there was, <laughs> one artist was trying to do his best to portray some of the Garden of Eden pictures and so forth, and there was one of Adam and Eve, and they said, but they had a covering of light, and he was so frustrated, he says, how many watts do you want? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Although everything God had made was in the perfection of beauty, and there seemed nothing wait, uh, wanting upon the earth, which God had created to make Adam and Eve happy, yet he manifested his great love to them by planting a garden especially for them. A portion of their time was to be occupied in the happy employment uh, of dressing the garden and a portion in receiving the visits of angels, listening to their instructions and in happy meditation. Their labor wow. was not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating invigorating, right? The beautiful garden was to be their home. Let me interrupt again. How would you like to have the angels come and visit with you and instruct you? Do they really have wings? That's my yeah. answer to that one. Yeah. It's not going to do them any good in outer space. Not going to do any good at all as soon as you get beyond the stratosphere. Yeah. yeah. In this garden, the Lord placed trees of every variety for usefulness and beauty. There were trees laden with luxuriant fruit of which rich fragrance, beautiful to the eye and pleasant to the taste, designed of God to be food for the holy pair. There and were how, let me interrupt for again. I'm sorry. I just got thinking of all kinds of stuff here. How many of those trees that then flowers and everything that were in the garden? were later reproduced outside the garden? Or was it completely different kind of plants outside the garden? No, maybe deteriorated gradually at all. That's interesting. Hmm. Go ahead. There were the lovely vines which grew up tight, laden with their burden of fruit, unlike anything man has seen since the fall. The fruit was very large and of different colors, some nearly black, some purple, red, pink, and light green. Hmm. This beautiful and luxuriant growth of fruit upon the branches of the vine was called grapes. They did not trail upon the ground, although not supported by trellises, but the weight of the fruit bowed them down. <coughs> it was the happy labor of Adam and Eve to form beautiful boughs from the branches of the vine and train them forming dwellings of nature's beautiful living trees and foliage laden with fragrant fruit. And imagine the, imagine the fragrance as well. Oh, yeah. It must have been just beyond belief. Okay, Duane, why don't you pick it up there? The earth was clothed with beautiful verdure, while myriads of fragrant flowers of every variety and hue sprang up in rich profusion around them. Everything was tastefully and gloriously arranged. In the midst of the garden stood the tree of life, the glory of which surpassed all other trees. Its fruit looked like apples of gold and silver and was to perpetuate immortality. The leaves contained healing properties. So now, Adam and Eve in Eden. Go ahead. Very happy were the holy pair in Eden. Unlimited control was given them over every living thing. The lion and the lamb sported peacefully and harmlessly around them or slumbered at their feet. Birds of every variety of color and plumage fitted, flitted, flitted among the trees and flowers and about Adam and Eve while their mellow-toned music echoed among the trees in sweet accord to the praises of their creator. Again, I'm going to interrupt for a second. I just got a great message from my daughter today on my phone with a picture, with a little short movie. Um, way back several months ago at her birthday, I bought her a, um, a bird bath. It stands in her uh -huh. nice garden they have built behind, in the back of their house. But we've never, she's never been able to get the, gir the birds to come down there and figure out what that bird bath is all about. Well, at Christmas time, 
uh, her son bought a little bought her a little thing and I don't even know how it's powered exactly but it's a tiny little fountain that sits right there in the middle of the birdbath and puts up a little spray well she was so excited today for the first time a bird came down and enjoyed the birdbath so we'll see what happens yeah. just think about this I mean think of the birds in, in, the, in, the, in the biblical I mean I, I lived for many years in East Africa and the, the color of birds in East Africa is just beyond belief iridescent colors of every shade and oh man I'm sure the ones in, in the Garden of Eden were even better okay Adam and Eve Adam and Eve were charmed with the beauties of their Eden home they were delighted with the little songsters around them wearing their bright yet great graceful plumage and warbling forth their happy cheerful music the holy pair united with them and raised their voices in harmonious songs of love praise and adoration to the father and his dear son for the tokens of love which surrounded them they recognized the order and harmony of creation which spoke of wisdom and knowledge that were infinite some new beauty and additional glory of their Eden home they were continually discovering, which filled their hearts with deeper love and brought from their lips expressions of gratitude and reverence to their Creator. This is from the book Story of Redemption. It's actually, uh, those are extracts from the series Ellen White wrote back in the 1870s um, entitled The Spirit of Prophecy, Volumes 1 through 4. So, how much faith is how much is your faith impacted by your understanding of the creation story is it important to you that god created if you believe the first 11 chapters of genesis are just myth does it does that impact your faith now let's be clear here what we're talking about to some of <coughs> us uh myth means immediately it's not true in a biblical sense, myth means it might be true, it might not be true, but the story is told almost like an allegory to teach important lessons. Not to say absolutely it's not true, but not to say either that it is true. Does, does that impact your faith if you think, well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true? Evolutionists, as we've already mentioned, do not believe that God created uh, this universe. They do not want to even acknowledge that He exists. So if faith is a relationship with a person well-known, to whom do we relate? To whom do they relate? I mean, is this, um, they cozy up to a snail, or they cozy up to a slug, or, uh, I mean, you know. No, it, it has to make all the difference in the world. Yeah. Just incredible difference between believing that God is a person that cares about us and loves us and has done so many things for us as in contrast to the idea that we just somehow happened. Well, the creation story should also impress upon us the importance of being careful stewards of what, of what God has left us. I mean, we may have things that have deteriorated a lot, but shouldn't we be careful of what's left? The world may be corrupted by our human activities. However, we need to preserve as far as possible what is left of God's creation. Some Christians try to set aside the first 11 chapters of Genesis as a myth or allegory. We mentioned that briefly. If one suggests that those stories are not true, then she or he is claiming that many other Bible authors are lying to us, including Jesus himself. Look at some examples. First Chronicles 1.1. Adam was the father of Seth. Seth was the father of Enos. Enos was the father of Kenan. Is that not true? I mean, will we probably Ezra wrote that. Isaiah 1, 2. The Lord said, Earth and sky, listen to what I am saying. The children I brought, I, I brought up have rebelled against me. Isaiah believed the, the story. Look at Daniel 1, 12. Test us for 10 days. He said, give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. So what's Daniel saying? He's saying we want the original diet. We want the, you know, the Edenic diet. Let us try it and see what happens. And especially John 1, 1 to 14, and you know that passage. In the beginning, the Word 
already existed. The Word was with God, the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Um, through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was the source of life, and this life brought light to people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. God sent his messenger, a man named John who, came, John, who came to tell people about the light so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. The world, I'm sorry, the word was in the world, and though God made the world through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. And some, however, did receive him and believed in him. So he gave them the right to become God's children. They did not become God's children by natural means. That is, by being born as the children of a human father. God himself was their father. The word became a human being and full of grace and truth lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as a father's only son. So are we going to say that those stories are not true? those authors were mistaken. For those who can read Genesis 1 and 2 in the original Hebrew, it is a thing of beauty with plays on words, plays on sounds, parallelisms, and well-balanced structures. It is written almost as a poem. Some people have described it as the rhythm of sevens. Since seven is considered to be a perfect number in the Bible, it should apply it to God's creation. For those who understand the original language, these two chapters in Genesis were written using a form commonly applied to genealogy. What's genealogy? Uh, keeping track of all the different <coughs> lines of people. Yeah. yeah. Father to son to yeah. son to son. So that's, a, that's a, a standard form used in the Bible. And you know how many genealogies there are even in the book of Genesis. Yeah, and then there's that huge long one in First Chronicles, same story. But in, in the first two chapters of, of um, Genesis, there's a form that pretty much fills, fits that sort of thing. Again, suggesting that this is a real story. This is not, you know, just a make, yeah. make believe something to try to teach you a lesson. The re uh, go ahead. Who do we have next? I guess that would be me. The reason the biblical text of creation has been written in the form of a genealogy is to connect it with the other genealogies of the book of Genesis and to alert the reader that this report about the event of creation belongs to human history to the same degree as the lives of the patriarchs. And you know that especially when it came to the Levites, but also to the other tribes, uh, if you wanted to be a priest, what did you have to prove? Your genealogy, you got to show, okay, boom, 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 and I'm right there, boom, I, I belong to this line. So in the ancient times, those genealogies were very important. The Genesis creation account does not present itself as a scientific analysis of the event of creation. As such were the case, the creation account should have been written as a very complicated and infinitely long formula that would be inaccessible to humans. The biblical author writes under inspiration the report of the event of creation as a historical event. All that he says about the creation event is true and should not be in conflict with science. From our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 14. Some people feel that Genesis 1 through 11 is a spe and especially the account of creation is not, not intended to be historically accurate, but just stories to edify us spiritually or a miss. But, in, sorry. But in actual fact, the theological message proceeds from the historical event. The historical events is what gives us a picture of the theological truths. In Genesis 1, we are told that God created the heavens and the earth. This is a con construction from the Hebrew known as a merism, in which two contrasting parts, heaven and earth, refer to the whole. Thus, when the Bible talks about heaven and earth, it is really speaking about the entire universe. Many modern versions reflect this. Looking at Revelation, I'm sorry, looking at Genesis 2, 1 through 4 again, 
Jim, can you take that Genesis first? 2, 1 to 4, and so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and Come on. Let's stop scrolling on us here, doing and stop working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day he had completed his creation and stopped working. And that is how the universe was created. Goodness Notice God. how the universe was created. Now, if we, if we could go back and look carefully at the first couple of verses in Genesis, uh, you know there are different ideas about, you know, where did God create a whole lot of other things before he created this earth? Was this earth and this solar system made back in the beginning, way, way back somewhere, and then he came and he took this ball of stone and water and so forth and then made a word out, world out of it? The world just refers to the coating, the, the covering of this earth. So there's lots of possibilities here. So we would suggest that if it is going to be true to what we know about God, theological thinking must first begin with the acknowledgement of the truth of creation. And the truth of creation is what? It starts with God. Oh, yeah. And obviously evolutionists, back in the beginning, and I suppose there are some evolutionists today who wouldn't like to, don't want us to go back and follow it, but it's very clear that that, that theory came about because people were trying to figure out how we, what we, how we could have existed, where do we come from without God, without making, having God as an excuse. We do not see what happened. We weren't there, although apparently from what we read from Ellen White, she saw many of these things in vision. Well, we just read that long passage about her experiences. I, I wish that I often read things from her and I wish I could, hey, could you sit down for a moment? Let me just, how did you see that? What, what happened there? So do we celebrate the Sabbath in ways that commemorate our beliefs about creation? Now in the last few seconds we have, what things are we supposed to celebrate on the Sabbath that happened on special Sabbath days down through creation, down through biblical history? Creation, obviously, what comes next? The giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And the third one, which is really important, was the crucifixion, the rest in the grave, and the resurrection on Sunday. So those are our Sabbath beliefs. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come today to study your word and to see if we, what truths we can extract from these simple but very profound words in Genesis 1 and 2. We thank you for the opportunity to study this lesson together. May your blessing rest with us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.